On social media recently, I saw this map going about. In red are all the countries mentioned in the Bible. The map has been posted and reposted now for a few years, and in the comments below, there was some confusion. It doesn't include any biblical references or explanation. And how is France there and not Jordan? I thought I'd put my degree in biblical history and languages to good use, and investigate this question for myself. And I came up with this map. A Bible accurate version, you could say. I want to break this map down for you, and explore all the interesting historical and linguistic tidbits I learned along the way. Pack your bags and bring your sun cream, as we explore the countries mentioned in the Bible. Wait, hang on, there's a problem with this title. You see, when the Bible was written, the countries as we know them today didn't even exist. In fact, the modern definition of a country itself didn't really come about until a few hundred years ago. So it's not very historically sound to say that the Bible mentions actual countries. Well except for some very rare and interesting exceptions. The title of this video should really be Regions or Locations Existing Within Current Geographical Boundaries That Are Referenced To Or Mentioned In The Bible. But that's a pretty long-winded title for a YouTube video. Oh, and there's something else I ought to explain. The Bible. There's no one version of it that all Christians can agree on, although that would be nice. Instead, each denomination tends to have its own canon and translations, meaning that different places appear in different Bibles. And don't get me started on the Apocrypha. The Bible I'll be using is the New Revised Standard Version, which is used in academia and biblical studies. That means I won't be using the Book of Mormon. Sorry, America. Alright, that wraps up my overly detailed disclaimer. Hopefully I prevented any political and religious flame wars from erupting in the comments. Okay, let's get going. I'll be starting in the Middle East, the geographical region where the Bible originally came from, beginning with Israel. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this country is, by far, the most mentioned in the Bible. In Hebrew alone, the word Israel is used 2,485 times. Makes sense, it's where almost all of the Bible stories are set. There are so many biblical names that can apply to this region, from Canaan, Samaria, and Judah, and there are other territories like Gaza and Philistia that represent the modern state of Palestine. Moving eastwards, and we have Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers, a land that's today known as Iraq. The fertile shores left by the Tigris and Euphrates gave rise to the ancient kingdoms of Assyria and Babylonia. Both appear in the Old Testament, as Israel's larger, not-so-friendly neighbours. The Bible is full of various battles, invasions, and prophecies about these two kingdoms. In fact, it's believed that many biblical texts were written and compiled in Babylon, somewhere between 587 and 539 BC a period known as the Jewish Exile. As they lacked a homeland, the early Jews wrote down their stories and laws in captivity, which gave rise to the Torah. Speaking of rivers, next up is Jordan. Today, the River Jordan marks the boundary between the states of Israel-Palestine and the modern-day Kingdom of Jordan. This river has a very special status in the Bible. Joshua crossed it to conquer Canaan, and Jesus was baptised in it to conquer sin. In the Old Testament, the people who lived beyond the River Jordan were known as the Moabites. Sadly, the people who wrote the Bible didn't have very nice things to say about them. According to the book of Genesis, the ancestor of the Moabites was the result of an incestuous love affair between Lot and his eldest daughter. It's fine, the Moabites wrote similar nasty stuff about the Israelites too. Travelling south is Midian, a region that's today known as Saudi Arabia. It's a dry and arid place, and famous for being the land in which Moses and the Hebrews partially spent their 40 years wandering the desert. The highlight of that journey had to be Moses receiving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Today, there's a bit of debate where that mountain actually is. Most believe it's Jabal Musa in Egypt, but there are four other contenders found in Saudi Arabia. It's still uncertain. But in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says that the real Mount Sinai is somewhere in Arabia. So there's that. 
The question is, does that correspond to the borders of modern day Saudi Arabia? If someone figures out the answer, there might be a certain lost treasure to be found. Up north, we have Aram, aka Syria, and Lebanon, aka Lebanon. Like Israel, Lebanon is one of the few countries whose name is preserved in the Bible. Since ancient times, the region has been famous for its trees. Most of all, cedar trees, which were reportedly used to build King Solomon's temple. The cedar has since become Lebanon's national emblem, and even appears on its flag. Further north, we have Turkey. In the Bible, this region is given lots of different names, none of which are Turkey. From Cappadocia, Anatolia, the land of Hatti, Sicilia, Phrygia, to Pontus. In the book of Acts, it's simply known as Asia, not to be confused with the continent Asia. This version is Little Asia, or Asia Minor. Now for something a little mysterious, the land of Ararat. In the Old Testament, it's described as being a distant mountainous region, famous for being the place where Noah's Ark landed after the flood. Biblical scholars believe that Ararat is the Hebrew version of Uratu, a kingdom which corresponds to ancient Armenia, a kingdom which in 300 AD became the first state to officially adopt Christianity, a decade or so before the Roman Empire. The final Middle Eastern country I haven't yet mentioned is Iran. Historically known as Persia, the Bible celebrates this nation for ending the Jewish exile and returning Israel to its homeland. The book of Isaiah gives a special shout out to its king, Cyrus the Great. He is given the title Anointed One or Messiah. Persia has played a huge role in the history of the region and at a time was one of the largest empires of its day. In fact, the book of Esther tells us that its borders stretched all the way from Kush, more on that later, to a province called Hodu, which is often translated as India. Hodu likely refers to the Indus, a river that flows through modern day Pakistan. Despite this, it's where we get the English words like India, Hindu, and that biblical word, Hodu. So, Pakistan and India, congratulations, you've made it into the Bible. There may be another ancient reference to India in the Bible. In the Book of Kings, King Solomon not only imports cedar trees from Lebanon, but also receives a shipment of gold, silver, ivory, and monkeys from the land of Ophir. These exotic treasures have led scholars to believe that Ophir is in southern India, or potentially even Sri Lanka. It might seem far out, but these areas have always been wealthy trading ports, famous for exports of sandalwood, precious metals, spices, ivory, and potentially even monkeys. The biggest candidate for the biblical Afir is Puvar, a bustling port at the tip of South India. Wherever Afir is, it's a long way from Jerusalem, that's for sure. And that about wraps up Asia. Here are the regions the Bible references so far. It's already a vast geographical area, from the spice ports of India to the cold mountains of Armenia. But we're only just getting started. Two more continents to go. Up next, Africa. It might seem hard to think of references to Africa in the Bible, but there are plenty. In fact, it's easy to forget that Israel has a border with an African nation, Egypt. Being one of the great civilizations of the ancient world, Egypt is a big player in the Bible. Unfortunately, however, it mostly gets portrayed as a villain. If you've ever read the book of Exodus or watched The Prince of Egypt, you'll be familiar with the story of how the Hebrews were enslaved by the Egyptians and how God uses 10 persuasive plagues to help unharden Pharaoh's heart. In the rest of the Bible, Egypt takes a bit of a backseat and leaves Israel well alone. They seem to have finally got the memo from Moses. A little language tidbit for you all. Egypt has a lot of names. The biblical word for Egypt is Mitzrayim and is still used today in Semitic languages like Hebrew and Aramaic. The name we use for Egypt is from the Greek Aegyptos, which is the origin of the word Gypsy, a derogatory term used against the Romani people of Indian descent. The ancient Egyptians refer to their country as Kemet, meaning black land, a reference to the dark and fertile Nile soil. Travelling up the Nile and we get to the land of Kush, a territory that is now Sudan and South Sudan. Sometimes referred to as Nubia, Kush is a criminally underrated African civilization. They too had pyramids, their own writings, and gave their Egyptian neighbours plenty of grief on the battlefield. 
The Bible contains plenty of references to the land of Cush, one of which I've already mentioned. According to the Book of Esther, it was the westernmost province of the Persian Empire, although in reality, Persia didn't hold on to this region for very long. Another interesting reference to the people of Cush is Moses' wife. Look at this 17th century painting by Jacob Jordans. You'll immediately notice that his wife is of African descent. In the Book of Numbers, we learn that she was a Cushite woman. While the Kingdom of Cush historically can be found in Sudan and South Sudan, some references to the land of Cush seem to refer instead to Ethiopia. The Bible also calls the kingdom Sheba. You may be familiar with the famous Queen of Sheba, who visits King Solomon's temple after hearing rumours about its splendour. To Ethiopian churches today, the Queen of Sheba has a very prominent role. The Ethiopian National Chronicle, the Kebra Nagast, traces the country's royal line back to the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. It's difficult to know where exactly the Kingdom of Sheba is today, but it probably was a territory that existed along the borders of modern-day Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and even possibly across the sea into Yemen. Wow, four countries and two continents in one. We complete our African nations in the Bible with Libya, whose provinces get a brief mention in the New Testament. Our biblical map is really starting to take shape, but there's one continent left to visit, Europe. By the time of the New Testament, the region of modern-day Israel-Palestine belonged to the Roman Empire. During this Pax Romana, the empire connected the entire Mediterranean with a network of busy shipping channels, something that the early Christians used to their advantage. Shortly after the death of Jesus in Judea, Christian communities began to spring up in coastal towns along the eastern Mediterranean, particularly in Greece. The Apostle Paul's many epistles were addressed to these Greek communities, whether that be to the Corinthians at Corinth, the Thessalonians at Thessaly, or the Philippians at Philippi. Greece became an early hub for Christianity, and Greek swiftly became the language of the New Testament. And then came Italy, or more specifically, its capital. Despite a few references to the province of Italia, Rome and the Romans are mentioned many times throughout the New Testament. There's even a book called Romans. The Eternal City would become pivotal in Christianity's status as a world religion, and for many people, Rome and Italy is the heart of the religion today. The New Testament references many smaller provinces that can be linked to the countries of Europe today. There's Cyprus, Dalmatia, which would become Croatia and parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia, which is in parts of Greece and modern-day North Macedonia, Scythia, which at that time would have referred to Romania and Bulgaria. There's even a reference to Spanian, which is likely Spain, and Portugal too, if you're feeling generous. In fact, Spain might feature in the Old Testament too. In the famous story of Jonah and the whale, the prophet attempts to flee God's presence by sailing west to Tarshish. Scholars believe that Tarshish may be Tartessos, a vibrant port city in the south of modern-day Spain. At the time, it would have been seen as the edge of the known world, so would have been a fitting place for a hapless prophet to sail in an attempt to flee God. The last place on our map is potentially the most controversial, and that's France. It's controversial as it appears in a book that's not accepted in all versions of the Bible. In the book of Maccabees, there's a reference to a tribe known as the Gauls. The Gauls were a Celtic people that lived in modern-day France. Now, France as a country is a package deal. Because of its unique political structure, all of France's current overseas territories are also technically part of France. Places like French Guiana in South America and French Polynesia in the Pacific are as much as France as European France. This means that, by a sheer constitutional technicality, the Bible can conceivably refer to Antarctica, as France has claimed to territory there. If we are to dubiously include France, our map goes truly international. But because France's inclusion is from a partially recognised biblical text, I'm going to partially recognise France on my map. Just like how France's claim in Antarctica is also partially recognised. Sorry France, nothing personal. There we have it, a map of every country that the Bible references. Is your country there? If not, should your country be on there? I'd be curious to hear whether the eastern land of Sinim, mentioned in Isaiah 49.12, could be a reference to China. 
Of course, this map is heavily caveated by the fact that almost all of these countries did not exist when the Bible was written. But shout out to Egypt, Lebanon, Israel, Persia, Cyprus, Greece, Italy and Spain that still exist today. Or at least go by the names that appear in the Bible. This map is a big improvement to the one that often gets circulated online, even if I say so myself. For one, it has neat references down the side. Feel free to screenshot my Bible accurate version and share it around. I have a higher resolution one in the description down below. When you look at this map from a distance, you'll notice how the majority of mentioned countries are in the Middle East. This makes sense. The Bible was written in this region. The biblical writers had lots to say about their close neighbours to the north, east and south. But the biblical writers also knew of lands outside the Middle East, from the rich African kingdoms of Kush to the exotic maritime ports of ancient India and potentially Sri Lanka, regions that lay on the periphery of the known world. The map stretches over a massive area. It's astonishing to think that the biblical writers were even faintly familiar with these places. One explanation for this is ancient trade routes. You may have noticed that many of these exotic lands are mentioned in the story of King Solomon's temple, and how precious raw materials were imported from faraway places. From the strongest Lebanese cedars to the finest Indian ivories. The temple was so luxurious, it was even talked about as far away as Ethiopia. It doesn't even matter whether King Solomon was even real. We know these geographical regions exist today, and the biblical writers seem to know of them as well. Used as a historical document, the Bible is a snapshot in time into the surprising world of early trade. Finding real world locations in the Bible reveals just how connected the ancient world was. These biblical people knew about their neighbours, both near and far, even if it wasn't mapped out as extensively as it is today. Come for the biblical history, stay for a lesson in geopolitics and early trade. Who'd have thought? Hey, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you like this video and want to see more, why not subscribe? A like and a comment also go a really long way. If you haven't heard, I've made an investigative podcast, The Interruption, available to download wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, and do check out the channel's merch over at Crowdmade. We have beanies, t-shirts and hoodies. Links are in the description down below. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.